Well, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Amen. It's always good to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things that I would like you to do is to grab your Bibles, as it is our tradition or my tradition, if you would just hold it up in the air, if you have your Bible or if you have an electronic device, and if you don't have your Bible, just hold your head up, and I want you to say to the Lord, thank you. Thank you. Oh, God is good, isn't he? Amen. We want to give him the glory and honor for all that he is doing in our lives. Amen? Amen. Especially because we know the time is short, and we are asking God to move in our lives in a mighty way. Amen? Amen. This is another reason why you're going to be doing the, the prayer week. Because we want to come as close to God as possible. So that we can ask him to lead and guide us. So that whoever he puts in our path, we will be a shining light to them. So that they may be drawn to the foot of the cross and be saved. Amen. Amen. Saints and sinners, saints and sinners. Let me tell you a short story before we go to prayer. A few years back, I was in Walmart, and I was in line, and the, there was this gentleman in front of me, and then there were um, two shopping carts full of things. It was around Christmas time, right? And, and, the, and the gentleman, he had uh, two items. And, and the ladies were talking, and one of the ladies looked back, and she saw the gentleman only had two items, and she said, well, you can go in front of me. You, you can go. Would you like to go in front? And he said, you sure? You sure? And she said, yes, go in front. And so he went in front, and then after he finished paying for his items, he said, sir, whatever's in the cart is also on me. And he paid for it. Right? It was 250 bucks or so in that, in that cart. And, and the lady said, oh, bless you, you're a saint. And then he looked and he said, no, 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 no. God deserves all the glory. Amen. Amen? Amen? Now, I would like to say to you that both statements were correct. And I will explain it in a moment. Let's pray. Father God. Your people have gathered to hear another word from you. Move across your congregation. Open our ears. Cause our, cause our eyes to see what you would have us learn today. In Jesus' name, your people said, amen. Saints and sinners, two sides of the same coin. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be, say that again, saints. Saints, called to be saints. You know, the last time I was preaching here, and I had addressed you as saints, and then after the sermon was over, a lovely couple who believes in the Lord God, we ended up having a conversation in the back there, and, and, and the person asked me, she said, so what, is, what should we be called? Should we be called saints or should be, we be called sinners? This is this great divide, right? And she felt like, no, I'm not a saint. I should only be called a sinner. And, and, and I was saying, well, well you know, I, I maybe have a little different perspective. I don't believe that our, our sins is our identity. I think our identity is in Christ. And so I believe that we are saints, who still struggle with sin, right? And so then I was, I was saying, you know what, us Adventists, you know, we, we, like to, we like to major in the minors, right? Things that really is, is not a salvational issue, but it, it was something that was sticking to me. I'm saying we have, you know, people who really believe in the Lord, who study the um, word diligently, love, love God, and sometimes we line up, even Adventists, on different sides of the, of the view on these different things. And one of the things I, I noticed, the reason why we do that sometimes, is because of definition. Is because of definition. And, and you know, it's similar to, uh, one of the things I always think about, like my brother Pete. If, if Pete came up and was speaking a lot of Spanish to me, 
I might not quite understand everything that he is saying, even though we may be in complete agreement. And so I think sometimes that occurs. Now let's talk about the saints being called. Our calling is to be saints, right? Now, does that mean will I be a saint Sometime in the future, in heaven maybe? Or am I a saint now? Which is it? Which one is it? Again, I believe it depends on the definition one is using. You see, we, we, even in the Adventist church, we have a lot of converts, a lot of people coming in, and they come in with different beliefs from different backgrounds, different things that they've heard and they've learned. Like, for example, let's look at the Catholic Church. If you look at the Catholic Church and most of the sister Catholic churches, one of the things they believe is that these exceptionally faithful people, not all, but these ones that was exceptionally good, they had really good works that they did on earth, that when they died, they became saints. Not all, just some, based off of what they had done while they were on earth. Earth. And so some of them would begin to be called saints. Now, most world religions also kind of base this concept of being a saint on really good behavior and the things that you do. Um, they recognize exceptional degree of holiness, which we tend to think of when you think of somebody being holy, you think of them being like sinless, right? Doing all the right things. And so to the most degree, most churches say that, or most religions say, a saint is someone who is holy, very close to God. So I wanted to look up some definition. We talked about definitions, so I looked up the strong concordance, and there were several definitions. And I wanted to use definition number four. It was the fourth definition down, because I believe that is what a lot of us use when we think of saint. We think of our behavior. We think of what we look like when we think of the word saint. And so the number four definition for saint, in a moral sense, it means pure, sinless, upright, and holy. And if you use that definition, none of us are saints or can be called saints. In fact, there is only one, the Lamb of God. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. There is only one moral saint, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the only one who was sinless. So how does that leave us? Wait a minute. Well, does Paul agree with this? Well, Paul goes on and says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He goes on and also says, what I will to do, I do not practice. And what I don't want to do, I do. Later, he, he ends it and he says, for it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He began to separate the identity from the sin problem, right? And so we see here, yes, that we as saints, we struggle with sin. So does that mean then we should define ourselves as simply sinners? Is that the only definition was used? So let's look further with the Greek translation. It says the number one definition implies something set apart and therefore different. Do you remember what 2 Peter says, that when God tells us that we are royal priests? Chosen, holy nation, special possession to God for his holy use and purpose to remind everyone of how he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has set us apart. For him. Oh, you like that definition? I like it. It goes on to explain, which denotes individuals who are consecrated to God, set apart for his special purpose and considered holy by God. By God. 
What about the New Testament writers? How did they view this subject? Well, do you know they use the word saint 62 times to describe the people of God in the church. The word saint is only used 100 times in the Bible. 62 times it's used to describe the saints, God's people, 62 times. So how are we to understand this bit? Let me grab this coin for a second here. And, and Pete, can you come over here for a second? Just real quick. I'm going to show you this coin. And Pete, take a look at it. Now, there's, there's no secret I like the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm a football fan, and this is a, yes, a coin that my wife got me when the Steelers won the Super Bowl back in 2006. And what's on the front of that coin? Pittsburgh Steelers helmet. Pittsburgh Steelers helmet. What's on the back of it? Uh, the logo of the NFL. Logo of the NFL is on the back, right? Right. Why isn't this called a Pittsburgh Steeler NFL item? Why isn't it called that? What is this called? Coin. coin. Why is it called a coin instead of a football helmet or a NFL logo item? Who, who, who named this? Oh, you, you're not joking there. That's my sister right there, boy. We, but who named this item? Who, you can sit down, Pete. Who, whoever created it, right? They named it. And, they, and, the, and the governments came and they assigned value. This coin has value, right? And they named it a coin. Doesn't matter what's on the front or the side of it. These items can be used to describe, but it's identity, what you will always say, this is a coin. You won't use any other word for it. And so I'd like to suggest to you, in the coin of life, we have two sides of the same coin. Part of me have the Holy Spirit, and that represents me and God working in me, changing me, molding me, guiding me, reshaping me, changing my heart and my mind, putting his laws on my heart and my mind. Amen? And the other side is the fallen nature that God is trying to change, that has some des still some desires there that we're trying to shake free and break, which is the flesh. Galatians says that the spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another and that God gave us the spirit so that we wouldn't do whatever we wanted to do. That he would begin to change the fleshly desires so that our spirit and our, and our flesh will represent his glory and we can be called saints, which is who we are in Christ Jesus. Do we still struggle with sin? Yes. Yes. Are we striving to no longer deal with sin? Absolutely. That's why we need the feeling of, the G of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so we have this, this, this part of us that we want to walk in the glory of God. We want to fulfill, we want to keep his laws and his commandments. We want to do what is right. But sometimes that flesh still gets the best of us, sometimes, right? And so we come and we ask for forgiveness. God picks us up and he cleanses us. He washes us. And he tosses our sins in the deep of sea. See, when we think about this concept of what we are and who we are, this is how we think in life. If you're a plumber, people think you're a plumber. If you're an engineer, people identify you as an engineer. If you're a doctor, people think of you as a doctor. They still call you by your, you could be in here and they'll say, Dr. So-and-so, right? Because they, they try to identify with the things that we do. And when people who are in prison and they have committed crimes, when they get out, people still identify them as ex-cons, even though they can go on and do many good things for, in the, um, for the rest of their life. Many people identify them as cons. But that's not how the scripture sees it. Jesus over here, in, well, through Paul, is explaining, talking about these different uh, things that people have done that will not allow them into heaven. We'll pick up here, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkenness, nor slander, nor the swindler will, in, will inherit the kingdom of God. 
And that is what some of you were. were. Past tense. Why? Past tense. Some of them are still struggling with sin. Why past tense? Because he said, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You are not to say that's what you are. You once were, but no longer. You have been called to be set apart. When we use the definition of saints, we should always use it in the form of being set apart. So what does that mean? What does God want about us being set apart? Well, he says, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell where? He will dwell where? We need to be remindful that as we go out through our day, God is saying, I want to dwell in you. I want to dwell in you. And he doesn't stop there. He gives us something else. What did he say? He says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What a beautiful promise, right? And then the very next verse, verse 17, verse 17 says, starts with, therefore, Therefore what? Why, why does he use a therefore? Right? Well, we, 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 we go back. He says, because you are the living temple of God and God is trying to dwell in you, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Why is it so important for us now, if we, God has set us apart, why is it so important for us saints to, be, to not touch things that are unclean? Why is that so important to the Lord that we are set apart for him and we should not touch unclean things? Why? And we're not talking about pork here. Why do you think that's so important? Because we have struggles, right, and we fall. Why is it important... To, to attempt to stay away from those temptations and different things. Because of Jesus Christ living in our lives. Let me share this with you. Let me share this. Protect your testimony. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is a testimony. We need to treasure our testimony. Too many of us Christians take our testimony for granted. In my early days of being in the church, I took my testimony for granted. I no longer take my testimony for granted. Protect your testimony because God gave you a testimony so that he may be glorified in somebody else's life. Somebody who is struggling with something, God has sent you before them to call them out of it by you testifying by what God has done for you. Amen. But if we're running around wild and loose, if we're running around looking just like the world, if we're saying things just like them, if we're doing things just like them, if we feel just like them, if we're hating just like them, if we're condemning just like them, if we think we're better than other people just like them, then we are not set apart. We're part of the group. Amen. Amen. Part of the group. Protect your testimony. God says that we are a city on a hill. That's your identity. He says, you're sitting on the hill with a light that cannot be hidden. He says that, that, the, that, that the light stand burns the light for all who are in, in the house to see. That's him shining through you. He goes on and says, let your light. Many of us say, well, I, I, that's not my light. That's not my light. You're correct. It's, your, it's Jesus working in you that's causing you to shine. It's his light that's working in you, but understand he is in you. And therefore, the good deeds and the good things that you do is Jesus working through you, and others will see that, and that's why we have to say, no, no, it's not me. It's the work that Jesus is doing. Amen. See, that's why the young lady, when she said, bless you, saint, 
She was telling the truth because he was a saint set apart. And he was also correct by saying, no, 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 give the glory to Jesus Christ. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, we don't do good things to say, I'm looking good. No, we do them to glorify our Father. And guess what? We're becoming one like him. As we behold, we are changed. Right? Into his glory. Sing unto the Lord, O ye. Let me, let me say that again. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints. Right? Right? Well, am I, did I miss something? Should, should it say, sing unto the Lord, O you sinners? No. No. No, because he's talking about your identity. He has covered you. He has said that your past, your present, your future sins, as long as you continue to come to the altar, has been forgiven, wiped clean, and tossed into the deepest sea. He sees you through his son's eyes as clean. And so he says, you saints who have been set apart. Remember, it's always set apart is the definition we use. If I use the moral definition, I can't say saint. But if I use the definition of set apart, which is what I believe the writers of the New Testament was using those 62 times, God's people, their saints being set apart, being made holy. For God's purposes. He said, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. It is his holiness that makes us saints. It is his goodness that has every person sitting right here, right now, where we are today, is because of his mercy and grace. He could have just let it all fall apart. But he says, I love you too much. I love you too much. Because you belong to me. In Romans chapter 8, verse 27, he says, And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the sinner. Oh, oh wait a minute. I missed that. I missed that. Up. For, for the Spirit. Spirit intercedes for the saints. If you don't want to be called saint, you can't be part of that definition. The Spirit intercedes for those who have been set apart for God to declare His marvelous goodness. To tell the world about how He brought us out of darkness into His marvelous light to tell the world how he had gone to prepare a place, to tell the world it's not too late that God loves you. It doesn't matter what has happened to you in your past. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. God loves you. And it's not too late to come on home because he is coming back faithfully, not just to those who are alive, not just to those who are Americans, not just to those who speak English, not to just those who sit in a seven-day Adventist temple. God is coming back for all his people. One faith is what he's coming, to gather his children. Gather his children. And so the Spirit intercedes. Now, technically, Paul talking here about how the Spirit says, you don't know how to pray. And so the Spirit prays for us because we don't know how to pray for the things that we, that's deep internal. We may not even be recognizing that we still have some issues that God is trying to iron out. And so when we pray, the Bible tells us that God, that the Holy Spirit will pray um, um, for, on our behalf, right? But the Spirit also intercedes this way in, in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 14. The grace that has come to bring salvation, which is in the earlier part of verse 11, 
which we recognize as Jesus Christ and the grace of Christ, teaches us to say no to what? Ungodliness. So many people think grace is just mercy and forgiveness. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. The grace of God gives us self-control because it's the fruit of the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit, right? So God gives us um, control, fruit of control. The Spirit of God redeems us from sin and purifies us for God. I want you to catch that last one. In that text, you can look it up, it does not say, and he purifies us from sin. It says he purifies us for God. That relationship. God wants his family, saints. He wants, to, he, he, he said, I, I created this so that we can dwell with one another, so that I can love on you. So I can show you my goodness. and that, that, That's why I created this. I need you back. I didn't destroy you because I want you. I love you. I care for you. I haven't given up on you. Why does he do so much for us? Let me end with this, saints. I will be a father. When we think of a father, what do we think of? What was that? A failure? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What else do we, we when we think of a, a, a father that does it right? Protection. Protection. Someone to look up to. What else? Love. What was that? Yes. So provider, love, protection. All, these are all things a father should be, right? A father, a, a, someone who is true father, if the house is burning, the father makes sure everyone's out. If someone else is still in there, the father doesn't say to the mother to go in there. The father says, no, no, stay here with the kids. And the father runs in and brings the, brings the child out. It's the father, if someone is a criminal, comes forth and he has a gun, it's the father who says, stand back behind me. And he takes the bullet if, it's, if someone's got to take the bullet. And Jesus Christ, the father, came down here and he took the bullet of sin. He died on the cross. He rose again. He's sitting on the right-hand side of the father and he says, I will come back again for you oh he is our provider our daddy our abba who says i love you unconditionally come home and i will set you